Coming up on Market to Market, snow, tornadoes, and high winds sweep the country. We'll also take a look at work being done to keep the Mississippi River open for business. Plus, exploring new shipping routes through the Great Lakes and commodity market analysis with Ted Seifried next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, December 16th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The exhale you heard this week was the economy after the Fed grabbed headlines. But the devil was in the details of several economic reports. The Consumer Price Index moved higher by a tenth of a percent on a month-to-month -month reading. The core snapshot of inflation without gas and food rose two-tenths of a percent. The annual figure was up 7.1, which is lower than the peak back in June when the mark was 9.1%. Retail sales moved lower by six-tenths of a percent in November as consumers pulled back spending on furniture and electronics. The Federal Reserve surprised no one on another rate hike. What did cause some eyebrow raising was the only half a point increase in the benchmark rate. The week in weather was heavy. Heavy snow, blustery winds, and deadly severe storms in the south. At least three people died in tornadoes that stretched from Texas to Florida. The systems also brought much-needed moisture along the watersheds of the Mississippi River. Now, much of the snow won't melt and flow downstream for months, which is prompting those along areas still open for barge business to take drastic measures to keep goods flowing. Peter Tubbs reports from Mississippi. The water level of the Mississippi River has improved in recent weeks, but the river remains too low for normal shipping volumes. Draft depths for barges along most of the river are down 30% compared to normal levels. River depths in the lower Mississippi River have improved since record lows in October, but water levels between St. Louis and Cairo have deteriorated. The river level at Memphis neared the minimum operational limit in October, but has risen 16 feet in the last six weeks. Some barge operators have reduced the number of tows by half, and those tows include a reduced number of barges due to width restrictions on the river. Barges are often loaded at only 75% of capacity. Recent rains in the lower watershed have raised river levels by up to 10 feet in sections of the channel, but the long-term prognosis is for lower than average levels to be the norm until the drought is broken. Cape Girardeau, Missouri sits 50 miles upriver from Cairo, Illinois, and is accustomed to dealing with wide swings in the depth of the Mississippi River. For our area, the last major drought occurred in 2012, so 10 years ago. So. In between then and now, both of which were record-setting drought uh, disasters, um, we here in Cape Girardeau have seen several record-setting flooding issues. While it has experienced some economic loss from the lower river levels on a reduced basis for grains raised in the region, it has recently experienced damage to its infrastructure due to drought conditions. In October, shifting soil broke a 14-inch water main which placed the entire city under a boil order. So record-setting drought, record-setting flood, record-setting flood, now record-setting drought. That takes a toll on, on every city, every industry, every business. And it's just not very well seen. It's not obvious, but there's a lot of expense there. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. William Shakespeare said, sweet are the uses of adversity. The more modern version is making lemonade from lemons. The supply chain challenge of 2020 and 2021 sparked responses from creative thinking and turned into opportunities and diversity in how goods get from one point 
to another. Now, much has been reported about shipping on the coast, but the Great Lakes region is employing new and cost-effective ways to move goods out of the Midwest. The following story was done by Detroit PBS and their Great Lakes Now program. Laura Weber Davis reports. Since 2020, backups at ports in the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have left cargo ships stacked up, waiting to unload in the U.S. And rising fuel costs, congested highways, and a shortage of truck drivers are also creating headaches for businesses wanting to get their goods in or out of the U.S. interior. And they're looking for other options. Will Friedman is president and CEO of the Port of Cleveland. The companies that need to move these goods, either as a manufacturer or as a retailer, um, they're pretty desperate. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And they're now asking much more so than previously, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland and just avoid all that gridlock at, at those big ports? But rerouting cargo from congested coastal ports to Cleveland isn't so simple. On the Great Lakes, freighters mainly move bulk cargoes like iron ore, grain, and coal that are loaded loose into the ship's holds. But globally, most cargo is moved in containers. Great Lakes freighters and the ports they visit aren't really set up to handle large shipments in containers, but that may be changing. In 2014, the Port of Cleveland saw an opportunity and developed the first container service on the Great Lakes to handle import and export cargo. In partnership with Dutch company Splithof, they created the Cleveland Europe Express with a regularly scheduled route between Cleveland and Antwerp. The Peyton Lynn Sea, a small container ship, travels out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and across the Atlantic. The trip takes approximately 14 days, with a few days in each port to unload. And the opportunity to move other types of cargo on the Great Lakes in containers is providing new cost-effective transportation solutions for some shippers. It actually does help with cost for a ship to come all the way into Cleveland because the longer you keep cargo on the water, the more economical it is. The majority of the cost to move, let's say, a flat screen TV from China to Chicago or Columbus, Ohio, is the inland transportation, the over the land transportation. Once it's on a ship, even if it's a smaller ship, doesn't have to be a mega ship, doesn't cost that much because you have those, you know, economies of scale. You, you're just pushing that ship through the water. You're not burning as much fuel. It's also more sustainable. It's also a greener form of transportation. And according to Friedman, shipping through Cleveland avoids the delays that can happen at congested ocean ports. Unlike the big ports where your container may be on a ship and it sits at anchor, you know, waiting to get to a berth for 30 days or 15 days, uh, our service is more reliable. In Cleveland, the cargo and containers has been mostly industrial, non-consumer goods, and exports from northern Ohio and bordering states. But on more than one occasion, they have been the answer for a business outside their region. We just had some rubber, synthetic rubber, um, moving up from Houston, uh, getting trucked all the way up here uh, to get loaded onto the Peyton and go to Europe. Um, so. Uh, those are the kinds of, you know, somewhat uh, counterintuitive uh, moves we're seeing here with all these supply chain problems. They could not get a ship or find space on a ship out of Port of Houston, so they moved that rubber all the way up here. And Cleveland isn't the only Great Lakes port that's looking to expand its container shipping. The port of Duluth Superior is the largest port on the Great Lakes by tonnage, including the twin ports of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And it's making waves in container shipping. Deb DeLuca is the executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. From here, you can reach major markets such as the Twin Cities, Fargo, Des Moines, also Milwaukee, and even down to Chicago. So um, it, it, from, a, from a logistics standpoint, that's very attractive. Last fall, the Port of Duluth was granted approval by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to handle shipping containers by water. And just recently, it exported its first shipment, 200 containers of kidney beans from a company in the region. 
they were having difficulties um, arriving at a supply chain solution with all the snarls and backups and supply chains over the past couple of years. They were not able to get their goods to market. So um, they, working with a freight forwarder, a trucking company, they were looking for an alternative solution and that ended up being sending those containers by ship through our terminal. Great Lakes ports are also looking into new options like a feeder service where containers are offloaded in bigger ports and transported along the St. Lawrence Seaway in smaller vessels, similar to what is done in Europe. Along with all the opportunities, there are many challenges to container shipping on the Great Lakes, including the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which restrict the size of the ship. If you're coming into the Great Lakes from outside the system, you're limited by the dimensions of the locks. There are 15 locks that get you from sea level up to where we are, which is roughly 650 feet above sea level. And those lock dimensions are roughly 750 feet long and about 75 feet wide. Uh, and the controlling depth of the water in all the channels on the Great Lakes is about 27 feet, 27 or 28 feet. So ships can't exceed those dimensions. Another factor that has been challenging for container shipping is the shortened season. Both the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Sioux Locks close during the winter. Many who use the system or ports on the system are at, like me, advocate for let's keep the system open longer. Um, we think that's feasible from a technology point of view. We, we all know, unfortunately, with climate change that we're not getting as much ice cover anymore. Winters aren't as severe. Let's allow more year-round shipping or closer to year-round shipping. Both the ports of Cleveland and Duluth expect to move more shipping containers in the coming year. Next, the Market to Market Report. Drier conditions in Argentina and colder U.S. weather impacted the trade. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 19 cents, while the March corn contract it improved nine cents. China's emergence from COVID restrictions provided a volatility jolt to the soy complex as the January soybean contract lost four cents while January meal dropped by 860. March cotton expanded by 97 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, January class three milk futures added a penny. The livestock market was mixed as February cattle added 23 cents, January feeders cut 15 cents, and the February lean hog contract, a busy Friday, ended on a gain of $1.78 for the week. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index added 22 ticks. January crude oil improved 262 per barrel. Comex gold shed 1060 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index was higher by nearly 19 points to finish at 588.85. Joining us now is regular market analyst Ted Seifried. Hello, Ted. Hey, Paul. I want to look at headlines. I want to make sure I get something right here because this is the week of, uh, early in the week we're asking, is this a dead cat bounce? Kansas City shows some promise. Then we had no fresh news. Then all of a sudden it got cold. Yeah. What's the biggest mover in wheat this week in your opinion? No, I mean, look, that cold is, uh, is an issue. I mean, there's a lot of weather as a whole. I mean, when you look at snow and things like that, uh, which is, I mean, there, there's, snow's good to a point. You throw 22 to 24 inches, two feet of snow on, on something, that's maybe getting past that point of good. Um, but for the areas that think that snow, I mean, there's some really, really cold temperatures coming in here. Uh, and that's kind of what we're looking at. We're worried about, you know, winter kill. And it's wheat, you know, we can kill wheat how many times and it still can manage to, uh, to yield. But with conditions being as poor as they were even before that, with all the drought conditions, uh, I don't know if we'll have such a resilient crop this year. Um, okay. and, and you look at the drought conditions and the correlations, there's been a lot of studies done. We are not set up for a very good wheat crop this year. Um, what are we set up range-wise then, given what you're saying? Well, there's the other side of that equation, though, Paul, is demand. And the demand for wheat has been really lackluster as well. And, you know, you look at wheat, we are well off the highs that we had from the initial, you know, short squeeze that happened when Russia invaded, invaded Ukraine. But we're still at kind of relatively high prices for wheat. So 
you know, given all the fundamental inputs, the supply issues, but also the demand issues, you know, you can really make a, you can make a bullish case on the supply side. That bullish case gets diluted by the demand side of the equation. And then again, you look at where the prices are. You know, if we were trading 580 wheat, you'd have to say the supply issues are enough to give us a rally. But based on the fact that we're, we're not trading, we're well higher than that, you're really kind of left in limbo. And you're left with a market that's just really searching to try to find a bottom. And maybe we have, I don't know, you didn't have very convincing price action this week. But, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to carve out a longer term bottom. We didn't have enough action to form the bottom. Is that what you're saying? You didn't have the convincing price Got action it. to okay, say I that, get okay, that's the lows in now. All right, so, but we did pull corn along for a little bit this a little week. Bit. Uh, but corn also had some export news that was encouraging. Well, no? Uh, it, better than it has been. But we're still 48% behind where right. we were this time last year. So given the news of the week, yeah. have we set either a bottom or a top in the near term for corn? Whew. Uh, this is a good question. I mean, we're headed into some very, well, potentially very light holiday trade, choppy holiday trade. And generally speaking, the seasonality is positive for the time frame between the December report and the end of the calendar year. Um, it's usually because we don't end up making a whole lot of cash sales in that time frame. Generally speaking, we're all, we don't want to mess with our, our taxes any worse, <laughs> any more than we have. Uh, it's the time we spend with family, so we're not really busy hauling in, things like that. Um, and generally speaking, we are a little bit concerned about South American weather, so usually that's a, it's a good time of year to see a little bit of a bump. It's also a really good time to get uh, some of the new crop marketed. Um, whether this year is the same or not, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we're already kind of at some elevated levels. We've already factored in some South American weather in the form of Argentina dryness. If that Argentina forecast changes dramatically over the next couple of weeks, I think we could see a counter-seasonal move, but that's a big if. If it doesn't change, yeah, I think there... There's a chance that we have a, a halfway decent recovery in corn after the break that we saw earlier in the month. But the line is so small between Argentina and Brazil. Brazil gets rain. Can they get enough and, pr and create enough to counter your counter seasonal rally that you're talking about? I, Brazil looks pretty good. There are some problem areas in Brazil, and that's for sure. So the question is going forward, do, does the issues in Argentina spread northward to Brazil? And do, are we talking about a wider, a bigger, uh, bigger drought impacting a bigger area, but also maybe in a more important area in Brazil? Or are we looking at the Argentinian issues maybe starting to dissipate and go away? Like so many times in our growing season in uh, the U.S., we'll start with some dryness. But by the time you get to June or July, the weather pattern changes, and all of a sudden we're talking about a normal or maybe even better than normal crop. There's still a chance for that to happen in Argentina. Argentina is, what, 53%, 55% planted at this point? They're still planting mm -hmm. this crop. So it's not like it's July in Argentina right now. Uh, there's still a lot of time for that to turn around. It doesn't look great at the moment. The extended forecasts don't look great. There's a lot of heat. But weather patterns can change. Soybeans also had some export story to tell. Yeah. Did you like the export story better in soybeans? Well, the export story for soybeans has been better for quite some yeah. time. I mean, we are on pace to hit the USDA's target, maybe even beat it uh, if we are going to continue to see these sales elevated the way they have been. Um, it was, I think, what, the second best week uh, for, for soybean sales in this marketing year so far. Um, yeah, the soybean sales are good. Uh, you almost wonder... With the fact that exporters are continuing to sell as aggressively as they are, uh, they must not be too terribly worried about running out of soybeans further on down the line. So you wonder what that means for that January report. Um, you know, so I, pretty soon we'll start talking about what our expectations are for that January report. That's a big, big deal. You know, that's the final production number, a quote unquote final, because the <laughs> final numbers have a tendency to get revised as well. <laughs> um, but there'll be big changes on that January report. The question is in which direction. All right, let's do a little range game then with soybeans. Okay. Uh, but between now and that report that you're mentioning on the 13th of January, what do you see for a top in the November contract for soybeans? I, the, way the, the way it was acting on Friday, the, the way the price action has been acting this past week, it seems like soy, soybeans wants to want to probe higher. But every time we say that, we run into the $15 level and we kind of fail. I think there's a pretty decent chance that we're going to take a shot at like 15 12 somewhere in that neighborhood. 
Um, but then again, it's a weather market, right? If that weather changes or the news changes, I mean, there's so many different factors that can come out of the blue. I mean, if we've learned anything in the last five years, Paul, it's that we should expect something to be coming out of the blue at any moment. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, look, left to our own, own devices, really no change in, in weather, no change in, in outside factors. Yeah, I think we can check out that, that 15, 12 area or so. Uh, but who knows? I just, you, you, what you said gave me a question I'm going to ask you in Market Plus. So okay. I'll tease that. You have to come into Market Plus to see us talk about that 15. Uh, let's get Glenn in Ohio's question to Ted here now because Glenn's a little bit looking ahead there. Uh, he says, planting in Brazil and Argentina nearly complete. Will the dry weather in that region dominate the supply-demand conversation? Or will other fundamental events in the U.S. be the primary market mover now until spring? He's extending to pass the report. Sure. You've kind of danced around both. Now we're going to make Glenn put you on the hot seat. Yeah, and, and I kind of usurped Glenn a little bit here because, again, Argentina is, you know, they're not quite 60% planted. So when we say almost complete, I don't, know, I, I don't know if that's a fair statement. Also, uh, look, Brazil has multiple crops, and it is a very, very big area. So they are planting and harvesting at the same time and a lot of, a lot of times. Um, so, look, the South American weather story is really just getting started. That's something that we'll be watching very closely into June, for that matter. So uh, I, when you talk about the, the second season corn crop and harvest and everything like that. Um, so, yeah, I think the best way to answer this question, Glenn, is that lack of any other strong outside market influences, right? We are going to focus on grain fundamentals and what those grain fundamentals are for the moment is really based on South American weather and what's happening from an export standpoint. Those two things are very much related, by the way. But as we talked about, at any given time, we can get something to come into the market and completely shock it and make the outside fundamentals more important than the actual grain fundamentals. We're not in that time frame right now. Not saying that can't happen, though, at any, at any given point. All right, we need to move to livestock real quick. Cattle, equity pressure, or do you buy this as a technical move? I and mean, we gapped lower on Thursday. Yep. Still in an uptrend with cattle? You've got a nice little bull flagging kind of situation happening on a near-term cattle chart. Um, we're ex the expectations are for, for supply to drop very dramatically in the first, second, and third quarter of next year. If that happens, that's going to keep a pretty solid floor under cattle. You do have to worry about that equity market really kind of coming off. You know, or, or is the domestic demand going to be a problem? But short of a big, big problem in the stock market or a overall economy as a whole, I think the cattle market's got some pretty firm footing underneath it. I think we'll try to go higher at some point and break out of this. Again, bull flag scenario is a good, good thing to look at on a chart. And the way it traded on a Friday, to me, acted like it, it wants to stay in this range for now with the potential of breaking out further on down the line. Same theory in feeders? Same theory in feeders. Um, feeders are going to be, you know, more tied into corn activity, and it was a positive week for corn. Corn had that that strong day right off the bat in the beginning of the week, and then really held it throughout the week. I think that weighed on feeders a little bit, but yes, I'm optimistic there's upside potential for feeders as well. I looked at grains at midday and forgot to check the the livestock market, but hogs kind of took off. What happened? Yeah, hogs really did kind of take off. So. You know, hogs have been trading this very wild range uh, for quite some time, and, and the moves have been pretty significant. We had gotten very oversold in the short term. Um, surprisingly, cutouts came out quite a bit better. Uh, I think that is kind of what sparked it. But being oversold and being in this choppy range, I think that just, you know, kind of lit a match for a technical fire. Uh, and you had a really nice recovery day there in hogs. Now, whether we're able to follow that up early next week or not is the true test. You know, is that going to legitimize what happened on Friday or not? Uh, I, I don't, really don't know. In our few seconds remaining, is the China story about they're just opening wide up after COVID, is that impacting which market the most? The hog market? The soybean market or something else? Dude, I think soybeans the most. I mean, look, soybean meal, for a number of reasons, maybe some of them unknown right now, has been on fire, and that's what's really helping the soybeans. And I think China has something to do with that, but then also South America. Um, and as far as the hogs are concerned, you know, the, the Chinese story would be extremely helpful for hogs if we were to start seeing that reflected on an export sales sheet. To this point, we've not seen that. So we have to wait and see over time if that does or not. Great questions to come in Market Plus. Uh, we're going to get into ethanol and oil, uh, plus questions out of Canada, Nebraska, Wisconsin, and Iowa. So the gamut coming for you, Ted. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, thank you very much.
That's going to do that for the show. We're going to put a pause on this analysis, continue our discussion about these markets in our Market Plus segment. You can find that on our website of markettomarket.org. We have that in podcast form. We also have it on YouTube. And all of these resources, by the way, are free. The season for catch-up. Clean up and make sure you be good for Santa is here, and we can help keep you in the learning mode with a podcast. We have three options, the Market Analysis, the Market Plus, and the MTOM. Follow today wherever that you get your podcasts. Next week, we highlight an individual working for the greater good and feeding the world. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.